This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. We welcome you all this morning, this bright, sunshiny morning. It's a little brisk outside, but nevertheless, it's spring. So we invite all of you to come in and, and hopefully um, refresh yourselves as we bask in the love of Jesus. We have a few announcements. Uh, one I'd like to start off with is that our conference uh, has been asking for volunteers to serve uh, from June 16th through the 18th uh, during our annual conference, which will be held at the Hampton uh, Convention Center. Uh, they sent out emails to pastors, but with a link to uh, sign up Genius. But the genius of that move was that you can't sign up to that unless the pastor sends you that email. So if you want to volunteer, please let me know and I'll know where to direct the email so that you can sign up. I believe they need persons for registration and persons as ushers. Uh, the emphasis, of course, is because um, this area, the, the York River District, is acting as host of the conference this year. So they need a lot of volunteers. And then we have a few other announcements. Uh, uh, following our service, uh, Mr. Beverly has done something with the palms and anyone who wants to see how to make a cross out of your palm, uh, she'll meet you in the back in the narthex that you might be able to perfect that artwork. Amen? Amen. And then we have another announcement about our Lenten offering. If you haven't um, turned in your um, envelope, I hope you'll do it in the next cup. well, this week or next week. I think Jerry will take it the week after. Um, we talked about UMCOR and what they're doing for the Ukraine, but um, if you'll come up after the service, you'll see the other groups that we're trying to help. One is um, uh, the Agape Children uh, on Eastern Shore, and um, it's a wonderful program that they're doing for these children while their parents work, and it gets the younger ones under age five off to a good start when they get into regular public school, and they work on a shoestring, and it's primarily the Methodist Church and a lot of UMW groups that help to keep that program going. Um, there's also the street ministry in um, Cambodia that uh, Clara Biswas, our um, missionary, worked with for 20-some years, and she's retired, but they are keeping that program going. There are other um, young Asian people that are been appointed and are working with those children, so they still need our support. And right down the street, the Peninsula Rescue Mission, um, they help men, and um, they have been there for a very long time, and we have supported them. And um, if you remember Reverend Petit, he started it, and, and his son is uh, carrying it on. And then um, Youth Challenge has been changed its name to Faith Recovery, and they have some some new direction and some new programs. And although the women's shelter is not open right now, they are making plans to reopen in 2024, I believe it is. Um, but the men are still um, uh, helping others. So take a look and see if it's something that you uh, can feel like you can support. And um, I hope you will. Thank you. Do we have any, any other announcements? 
If not, as we uh, begin our time of worship together, I invite you to participate with us in our call to worship. Our Lord entered the gates of the holy city. But within the bounds of the city, there were those who feared him. Lord, enter our lives this day with your healing presence. Be with us as we march with you in the world of sorrow. Amen. And please pray with me our opening prayer. Lord of abundant pardon and mercy, be with us this day as we parade through the Jerusalem gates wanting the reign of God to be established immediately in the hearts of all people. Make us aware that fear and anger, powerful motivators for evil, open our hearts to the words of Jesus, that we might find courage and healing for all our burdens. In his name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is hymn number 278. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Following our prayer for illumination, our lengthy scripture will be read by uh, Karen Rickett. Would you pray with me for a moment? Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The gospel lesson this morning is from uh, chapter Luke 23rd, 1 through 49. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. 
Then Pilate announced to the chief priest and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stares at the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he heard that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. And Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called again. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time, he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished, and there then released him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal re rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed. His last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. 
When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now it's time for our joys and concerns, or concerns and joys, whichever you might prefer. Do we have any concerns? Courtney. Yes, we continue to pray for Courtney as she uh, undergoes her test, and I think she's preparing for surgery. And uh, have a joy and concern. My, one of my great grandsons, who was 17, usually a football player, but gave me a call saying that he was over at the complex in Hampton to play a basketball game. And uh, so we tried to prepare ourselves and went over. And uh, finally, about uh, 8.15 to 8.30 last night, he st they, the game started, and I know he felt that he wasn't going to get into play so that we might be impressed by his athleticism, but they did put him in. That's the joy. The concern is that they lost last night very badly, and they play once or twice today. So my concern is that they become well coached, and that even if they lose, that this might be a treat for them just to be able to travel this distance and play basketball. Isn't that amazing? It will be work for us, but they play it. Amen. I'm proud of him in any case. In fact, he's the one that uh, my wife mentioned has been accepted to a few colleges, so he's on his way. And likewise, it's a joy to have you. Amen. Any other joys? Well, it's always a joy to have Tori visit us. And our son has decided she, he's going to call her uh, Mama Junior. That she has encouraged this technique of talking constantly. <laughs> well, it is a joy to have them visit. It's a joy to know that they have a home to which they can return. Amen. And of course, we want to remember all of our first responders and those persons who are continuing to stay out on the front lines of this ongoing pandemic. We have eased some restrictions and we are continuing to nurse our wounds, but we should continue to be vigilant and not to take anything for granted for the uh, COVID-19 is still out there. You know, wouldn't it be nice if it came with a tag so you could see it coming? <laughs> but we can't. And God yeah, knows best. It would be nice if it had an expiration date, but I just saw that there's a possible surge in the fall. <laughs> and it, it continues to go around the world. I know China is having a difficult time now. And of course, some people try to say that it may have started in that part of the world, but it's certainly uh, making its rounds. And thank God for the vaccine. That is a joy for all of us and for those who are able to take it. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Merciful and loving God, 
So often we come to you with our individual concerns. But Lord, we are concerned even more about the devastation that is happening in your world. There's crime on the rise, in, even in this area. The people who are oppressed and depressed. Disease is still rampant. But yet, Lord, we are still able to stand. And when to stand, we are able to profess our love and obedience to the Christ child and to the Christ of Calvary that thought it's not robbery to take the form of man and yet remain Godward. Bless us each in our, our, our endeavors. Bless our homes. Bless our families, O oh God. Bless our communities and indeed bless our church. Help us, Lord, to withstand the wiles of the evil one and then to prepare for that great, great day when all our troubles will be over, all tears will be wiped away, and in fact, we can see Jesus face to face. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you join us as we pray the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we're going to pause. Just. I'm going to ask Sister Beverly if she will be gracious enough to come forward. And, and then I would ask for at least one volunteer from this side of the room to assist her as the songs are passed out. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day your son Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord, and follow him in a way that leads to eternal life. It's his name we pray, and it's in his name we receive these palms. Amen. We'll have a time of palm raising so that we can celebrate this ancient tradition of the church. I trust in that all have received a palm. Our hymn of preparation is hymn number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This?
I'd like to just sit and meditate on that last note. Uh, we are indeed privileged to be in this place. And my sincere hope is that God grant us the strength and courage to continue and certainly to worship him in spirit and in truth. I uh, keep getting myself in trouble with my sermon titles. I, perhaps some of you don't know the process. I try to get a sermon title and at least one or two scriptures into the office and, uh, so that uh, we can distribute our bulletins, our program, and uh, then they select the music and whatever designs and make sure that there's somebody to read the scriptures. And I, I am then left with what I consider the audacious assignment to try to come up with a sermon to match that sermon title. And the older I get, I keep remembering uh, what um, our foreparents said, you just keep on living. Uh, sometimes my brain gets, uh, seems to be disconnected and there's all kinds of distractions. You know, they say the human mind is capable of solving any problem that it formulates if it's not distracted. Problem is, it longs to be distracted. And that's where I find myself. Let, me, let us pray for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for last night's slumber, this morning's rising. And thank you, O oh God, for the hope of tomorrow, that whatever comes, that uh, we can allow the resources that you have already given us to equip us for that day. Bless, we pray, all who are under the sound of my voice. Bless those for whom we pray. Bless those, Lord, your children who are assembled here with us. May your grace continue to be sufficient for all our needs. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? Now either I have to come up to the name that's up there or I have to kind of reduce that name. Um, you don't know it, but my, my golf name, because I'm such a bad golfer, is, is Bubba. <laughs> and uh, I may have to list your sermon titles under the name of Bubba. Must Jesus bear the cross alone. That's a question each of us who profess and confess that Jesus, our benevolent, obedient, eternal Savior, died in our place. We all should need to answer each day we live. In this mortal life, there are countless opportunities to live into the possibilities that we can perform deeds that follow our rhetoric. One characteristic of Jesus' life and ministry is that he spoke a truth that he was careful to live out in his daily life. The scriptures attest to his obedience and personal integrity even to the point of death, and that death in a public place on a rough-hewn wooden cross. I suppose as we approach each Easter season, we consider superficial sacrifices which we usually practice throughout Lent. We have opportunities to bear witness to the truth to which we give utterance and allegiance, but only through a 40-day period of deliberate sacrifice. We arrive at Easter to a conclusion that does not always match our truthfulness. On Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection, the arrival of a, of a new revelation that death could not keep 
the power of truth, the way and the life in the grave to which it is usually bound. On Easter morning, all believing persons can acknowledge that the crucified saint was restored to life for humanity's sake. Yet before we can appreciate the full import of the resurrection, we must step backwards to analyze the recorded information that led to the humiliation, suffering, and death of Jesus on a cross. Not for the wisdom, truth, and revelation that he proclaimed, but for the inability of the gathered crowds to appreciate and comprehend that radically new expression of truth. Those crowds gathered initially to honor him for the new knowledge he proclaimed, the miraculous healing in his hands, and the radical wisdom and truth he provided. The parade started as his disciples and others gleefully uh, attempted to honor his messiahship. But it ended in a sea of confusion and injustice in a crowd of folks who could not accept a new gospel of truth, which he proclaimed with authority. Luke's account of the life, trial, death, and resurrection of Jesus demonstrates a commitment to truth that the world needs to exemplify, especially now. We live in a world foretold in scripture. We now live in a world where alternative truth can co-opt the minds of even the elect of God's children to accept its brand of truth and therefore the consequences that it offers. Today we get some information that is transformed and reformed to make formerly unbelievable things accepted as truth. Folks can lie to us in plain sight and through mediums never known to man. The precipitous effect is that it has become increasingly more difficult to discern fact from fiction, truth from lies, or faith from frivolity. So some evil deeds that men perpetrate are more easily excused because truth is an ever increasingly unavailable commodity. And that some untruth we hear and see cannot be verified. The Son of Man, written about in the Gospel of Luke, is a man whose mission was to go beyond a, a mere speaking of a new truth, but to fully live out the revealed truth of the God and Father who sent him to our cosmic community. He lived as he had spoken. He died as he has lived. And therefore, we can lift him high uh, above the cross of his crucifixion and hail him as our conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus said and did what he came to do. It, it sounds like an easy assignment, but it was for him and it is for us a far more difficult thing to accomplish. Peter, the rock, stood face to face with Jesus and declared his willingness to die with him. But his flesh would not allow his mind to follow through. Peter is an example for each of us. I need to employ a phrase my sisters used on me at table sometimes. And there was an unwritten rule at our meal table that intimated we could take all we wanted to eat, but we had better eat all we took. In my remembrance, I used to hear sometimes the chastising chant of, your eyes are bigger than your stomach, when I could not finish all I took. As Christians, we confront an inner voice that chastises us over the mismatch between our 
speaking and our doing. We speak from the abundance of our hearts before we can assess the measure of our abilities. From the, or the depth of our true commitment to a task. I suppose we are forgiven for those times. Those times when our personal circumstances interrupt our promised word or when our strength fails or our faith is stretched and tested more than we could anticipate. These are revelatory times. I, I overpromise and underdeliver sometimes when my strength, resolve, or devotion to duty wanes in comparison to the promises I have made to others or myself. I sometimes fail to count the cost. Surely there is a guilt payment owed, if only to myself. Some isolated and independent failures might be acceptable. But when these misjudgments and resulting failures become the pattern of my life, I conclude I have a fundamental problem. If I cannot depend on my own self-evaluation of my cans and can'ts, do's and don'ts, wills and will nots, how can others develop trust in my word? When my rhetoric strays far from my reality, I am lost. And so are we as we repeat behavior patterns over our lifetimes without seeking a new way to live. When I was a wee child, I used to quote gallantly, yes, I said it, I meant it, and I'm here to represent it. Like others, I was a bold little fella. But now that I am a man, I am not as boisterous in my self-proclamations as I used to be. The difference now is that I need not say anything aloud, and my record of living should verify my truth. My personal record of task completion should easily verify my resolve. We usually refer to this as personal integrity. At first, I thought to speak about all the truths and miracles that Jesus did as a testament to his unblemished record of performed deeds and acts of mercy. In truth, it's not about Jesus, it is about just us. Despite all the current expressions of our inhumanity to one another, regardless of the caustic nature of some public and private rhetoric, the atrocities of war, the suffering of individuals and masses of people, the government policies that retard our systems of justice. On this Passion Sunday, can we individually and collectively share the burden of the cross, the shameful emblem of our crucified Christ, the emblem of suffering and shame, by following his example and by rising to the high calling of letting our yeas be yeas and our nays be nays. We can bear a cross by keeping our word in every circumstance. Now can we each better say what we will do and then do what we say? It may not sound exemplary, but we can seek to improve our world, our own sacred trust, our families, our personal spaces, our shared communities, our world, by simply embracing the lessons of our faith. And as Christians, Decide to speak truth to power in love in all situations and circumstances. We, the church, 
We as individual believers have a charge to keep and a God to glorify as we look to the desires of a heart like Peter's and know the difficulties of binding our mouth to our bodies our rhetoric to our realities, we can overcome the power of darkness in the earth. If only one truth at a time. With a fixed mind and a body strengthened by the example of our crucified Christ, we can begin to repair the fragmented but redeemable realities around us. As I witness the rise in crime and its related activities, the destruction of our social norms, the suppression of normative ideas, the reckless misuse of our environmental resources, the reckless administration of health resources during a pandemic, coupled with the piercing silence of our religious leaders, I feel the weight of crucifixion and the accompanying suffocation which pressures my resolve to strive toward corrective actions. Each of these conditions and considerations are together more than any one mortal can correct. In the words of J.R. Tolkien, faithless is he that says farewell when the road darkens. As we gather in the safety and sanctity of this consecrated sanctuary, I see my own, with my own eyes that the road has darkened. I can call forth my present faith because Jesus sacrificed his life to strengthen me, to save me, to empower you, each of us, and to assign us as fishers of men. My hope is that others in our generation can rise and again speak and function as we ought. We cannot do it all, but we can do something. I ask again, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? The resounding answer, no, there is a cross for everyone and there is a cross for me. The question is, can, can I speak with a prophetic voice and likewise walk that same path in my living? Can we who are born for such a time as this faithfully follow the Christ we claim by being and doing, talking and walking as he did over 2,000 years before us? Can I rise so high and walk so straight that others will know that I serve a Savior who died for me? that I might find courage to seek an abundant life, yet still speak and act upon whatever I speak. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? Must we? Jesus bore the cross for us by being obedient unto death on an old rugged cross. Just this knowledge is a lot to bear. He died for me. He suffered. He accepted humiliation. He bled. He died just for me. On this Palm slash Passion Sunday, that for me is a heavy cross of truth to bear. The poet William Cullen Bryant penned, and it was also spoken by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Truth crushed to earth shall 
rise again. Amen. And amen. I should have told you that if you wanted me to stop preaching, you should have waved your palms. <laughs> but since nobody did, you arrived at the amen. <laughs> you arrived at the amen as I finished. Can I get an amen? Amen. And an A women. God is a good God all the time. And now, as they did in the Jerusalem crowd, let us wave our palms as a way to hail the Lord's anointing. We are here, and God is here with us because Jesus stayed true to his word. He didn't say a mumbling word. An innocent man died that we might have this right to live. Ain't that good news? Yeah. That's good news. Amen. Now if your arm is tired, you might <laughs> hold your, your palm. Let's see. Our hymn of dedication, I believe, is Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? Yes. Hymn number 424. And I'm going to sit down and enjoy it. <laughs> Amen. Please do not forget that you have an opportunity to make a cross or some other figure out of your palm. Service is over. Please remember that our church council will be meeting on April the 20th uh, at 12 p.m. Uh, we'll be downstairs at the in the Frank Collins Fellowship Hall. Um, I think I had another announcement, but... Thursday night. Oh, Thursday night, that's the other one. Well, we plan to assemble here that in, in a celebration of Monday Thursday uh, at 6.30 p.m. So all of you who can come or bring your neighbors and friends I usually tell people, bring both your friends. Um, assuming that some of us have reached the high pinnacle of having two friends. I, I used to have two friends, but I'm certainly not sure anymore. Amen. Would you stand to be dismissed?
Lord, we come to you as your children. We come as empty pitchers before a full fountain. Fill us, O God, with the love and remembrance of Jesus. Help us to know and to appreciate, to live according to our word. Let us be doers of the word as well as speakers of the word. And I bid you now in Jesus' name to go in peace, to be in service to one another and to the world. And by practicing personal integrity, help transform the world into a world that Jesus would know and love upon his return. Go and spread the gospel by being the living embodiment of that gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.